if you have any questions please put them either in the zoom chat or youtube link the youtube chat and I, we will pass them to the speakers at the end of each talk so the first speaker is dr xavier rogers he did his phd in the field of, of field of quantum fluids and solids before moving to university of alberta for his postdoc where he worked with john davis for the, then he did second postdoc in Royal Holloway, where he, he was awarded a Royal Society University Research Fellow to start fellowship to start his own group. And he is now working on superfluid optomechanics and quantum nanofluidics. So the floor is yours, Xavier. Thanks. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to try to share my screen. Yeah. Should work. And we'll take the pointer. Do you see the, the screen? Yes, I do. Oops, oops, okay. So first of all, uh, thanks uh, the organizers for the kind invitation. It is great to present my work at the Unicorn Seminar Series. I really enjoyed this, uh, this seminar series actually. So I'm going to talk about this work that we do at Royal Holloway. And uh, if you want more details about this, you can look at this uh, reference. This is uh, my group. So I'm going to start by acknowledging the, the people working on, on this. So um, it's a small group, but uh, a special acknowledgement to, um, to Seb, who did a lot of the work I'm, I'm going to uh, present today. And we've been recently joined by uh, Sumit and, uh, and more people are, are joining uh, this summer. So, so that's, that's great. So let's start with uh, superfluid optomechanics. There is the concept of, of viscosity. We are all uh, familiar with, it's their resistance to flow. Here I have a small schematic showing few substances with different viscosities from low to high. So this could be oil, this could be honey, for instance. And on this extreme here, we have the, the case of superfluid helium-4, uh, which has absolutely zero viscosity. And it's, uh, it's quite peculiar. For instance, if you had a, a bucket of superfluid here, um, the superfluid would just simply creep the, the walls of the container and, 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 and uh, this container would empty in a, in a few seconds. The, the liquid would creep up and fall down here. And that is the result of having absolutely zero viscosity. Uh, this phase is, is, is exotic. So that's the phase diagram of liquid helium-4. of helium four. You have liquid, solid, and gas. And you have this new exotic phase here at low pressure and, and, and low temperature, which is the superfluid phase. So when you go from the liquid phase to the superfluid phase, you cross a, a phase transition, second order phase transition, which corresponds to the um, atoms uh, falling into a, a macroscopic quantum state. So superfluid phase is a, is a, is a quantum phase of matter you will have a, a microscopically occupied uh, quantum state uh, similar to a Bose-Einstein condensate. And this um, leads to certain properties for the phase. And first, let's talk about this uh, ba somehow basic properties. So the sound velocity, the density, and the dielectric constant. These are small. So you have a small uh, sound velocity, a small density, and a dielectric constant close to one. So it's very transparent. And uh, <clears throat> this makes, uh, the, from the sound point of view, this makes superfluid helium behaving a bit like air. Now, it has some very unique properties. Uh, first of all, it can be, um, it is chemically pure. Because when you prepare a superfluid uh, helium sample, you work at low temperature or below two Kelvin all the other impurities are uh, absorbed on the, on, the, on the walls of your container. Um, so, you, so the only impurity you have is helium-3. And in addition, this substance can be purified uh, down to extremely uh, high level. For instance, here the, the quadrillion level is achievable uh, if you order it from some supplier. Uh, the sound velocity is tunable. 
which is nice for a mechanical element, for instance, in a, in a optomechanical setup. Uh, and you can tune the sound velocity with fluid pressure. It has an extremely high thermal conductivity, which is uh, nice for a low temperature physics. And very importantly, it has a ultra low acoustic loss and a ultra low dielectric loss, which makes it highly um, desirable for cavity optomechanics. You also have the presence of quantized vortices, which is quite unique, and you can uh, do uh, interesting uh, physics with this. <clears throat> so this system has been uh, uh, used uh, in, in various uh, cavity optomechanical setup. Um, so here I have shown a few examples in the uh, optical domain. So we have the work of the Bowen group with micro toroid disc and surface wave resonators. We have um, Jack Harris with the um, surface waves at the surface of levitating droplets. And he has also work on bulk acoustic wave resonators with liquid helium confined between optical fibers. Now, these systems have um, different mass. So we go from the picogram to a few microgram. So uh, even though superfluid optomechanic is new, we have already uh, uh, different systems with uh, which span different, uh, like a broad range of, of masses, uh, especially if you look at the microwave domain. So in the microwave domain, we have the pioneering work of uh, Keith Schwab here in 2014, where he, he had a superconducting uh, ca microwave cavity filled with liquid helium-4 and studying the bulk acoustic uh, waves in helium-4 and uh, how they couple to this uh, superconducting uh, microwave cavity mode. And we have the work of uh, John Davis more recent, uh, maybe he's gonna talk about it in his talk. And, and these systems have uh, uh, effective masses of the other few grams. And the work I'm going to talk about today is this work in which we, we are trying to um, bring this uh, mass down to the, to the picogram. And the the reason for, for it is mainly to um, exploit the fact that superfluid helium can fit any structure. And we will do a, a nanofluidic structure to have a very small sample. And therefore, with a small sample, you can expect a larger zero-point motion and, there, and therefore a larger optomechanical coupling strength. And you can start to, uh, to do interesting um, uh, physics uh, in, in that uh, new uh, scale. So let's talk about dissipation in a superfluid helium-4. So in many applications, you need low mechanical dissipation uh, when dealing with uh, uh, cavity optomechanics. The dissipation comes from different sources. We have the extrinsic sources, intrinsic sources. <clears throat> the, um, the intrinsic one can be uh, caused by surface losses, material defect, and so on. Uh, the picture is a lot simpler in helium. Helium has been uh, studied for decades, and people have found the main sources of dissipation, especially at low temperature, where the situation is a lot simpler. So that is the spectrum of excitations in superfluid helium-4. We have the phonon branch, the maxon, roton, and there, at higher energy, you have multi-excitations. So we will work in that uh, low, um, uh, in the left uh, bottom corner here at low temperature, where the only excitations are phonons. So that is the equation for the phonon branch. It's, it's near, it's almost, uh, it's, near, it's uh, linear with a small deviation from nonlinearity caused by this constant gamma. And you have different regimes. And at low pressure, below 20 bar, gamma is negative. So you have this uh, uh, curve here for the phonon branch. I, I've just exaggerated it. And in that regime, the dissipation will be caused by the three phonon process. At higher pressure, uh, above 20 bar, the three phonon process is forbidden because you need to uh, conserve energy and momentum. And when the curve is like that, you cannot, you cannot do it with three phonon. You need four particles. So dissipation is caused by the four phonon process. And I'm going to focus on the three phonon process because this is the one that has been observed experimentally. Uh, the four phonon process has not yet been observed in superfluid helium-4 because other sources of dissipation um, arrive before you can observe it. So here is the equation you have for the acoustic attenuation in 
caused by the tree phenon process. Uh, I want you to look at this uh, part of it. So it's linear in frequency and it's proportional to T to the four, meaning that at low temperature, the acoustic attenuation really drops very fast. This uh, attenuation comes from the fact that acoustic phonons will be absorbed by thermal phonon in the, in the bath. And this is, this is the, 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 the mechanism for the, the tree phonon process. It's also called the Landau process. And this uh, acoustic attenuation has been measured a um, long time ago. And the T to the power four dependence has been a verified experiment. Now, there is another regime at higher frequencies, which has not been observed. And that is when uh, H bar omega Q is get, getting comparable with KBT. And the, the acoustic phonon then can emit thermal phonons. Now, if you want to make a cavity optomechanical setup, you will have a, an acoustic resonator for superfluidium, and you can define a quality factor. And here is a, is a graph that shows the quality factor you would expect if the, the only source of dissipation was this term, this three phonon process term, at different temperatures as a function of frequency. And so you see that because the, the attenuation is linear in frequency, the Q factor becomes independent of frequency. And you have these plateaus at different temperature. And at 10 millik, you have this gigantic quality factor of 10 to the power 10 that you would expect at this, uh, at this temperature. And then you have the, uh, the threshold at high frequency where the, the Q factor drops because you have the Belayev process I mentioned. This is when the, the acoustic phonons have energies comparable with KBT. And uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this gigantic uh, Q factor has not been uh, measured. However, in the Keith Schwab exper experiment I uh, showed you in the introduction, um, they observe a Q factor of 10 to the power of eight. So it's, it seems uh, um, feasible if you can get rid of the other sources of dissipation. So we've seen the phonon-phonon interaction, the three phonon process and the four phonon process. The four phonon process would lead to even higher Q factors at 10 to the 15, 17 and so on. It depends on the temperature. But this, have, as I said, never been uh, observed because it's uh, extremely high. There are other sources of dissipation coming before. There is the phonon to helium-3 impurity um, interaction. Uh, however, you can deal with this by using ultra-pure helium. And there is the container uh, boundaries. Um, and, but this, once again, can be uh, eliminated if you have very smooth surfaces. So, um, the source of dissipation here would be the scattering of your phonons uh, on the roughness of the walls. So if you have low roughness, then the, the effective mean free, press, mean free path can be uh, increased. So um, that can also be uh, been reduced using a very smooth uh, surface. So let's talk about the, the container I plan, I'm planning to use for this uh, superfluid acoustic uh, resonator. This container is basically a tiny box. Uh, it's, a, it's a box that you make using nanofluidics. And uh, nanofluidics uses standard nanofabrication techniques, uh, lithography and etching and, and so on. Here are a few examples of uh, nanofluidic um, geometries <coughs> that have been made at uh, U of A or, or at Cornell in collaboration with Royal Holloway. Here is a glass glass uh, substrate. So the, the way we make these is relatively simple. We have one substrate, we do a lithography step to etch a certain geometry. In that case, we have a cylindrical cavity and two channels, rectangular channels. So we etch that down with plasma etching or chemical etching. And then we have another substrate and we bond it on top um, using direct wafer bonding. And this works when we have extremely clean surfaces and it relies on Van der Waals interaction, which are strong enough to give you a weak bond. And this can then be annealed and it gives you a strong bond. You can do it with different substrates. And there are plenty of techniques out there. Uh, what you see here is uh, the colors come from white light interferometry 
just because the size here is comparable with optical wavelengths. So what's the interest of this small box for superfluid optomechanics? Um, the interest is to have a small effective mass and therefore a large optomechanical coupling strength and also a large uh, range of mechanical frequencies you can uh, obtain by simply um, engineering your, your shape here, which is very easy to do with a lithography technique, whether it's optical lithography or even electron beam lithography. Uh, so that there is a, a broad range of devices you can, you can make. Um, now, here is an example of a device uh, I've worked on uh, at U of A. It's a superfluid Helmholtz resonator. So the way we've done this is following the same process I just explained. So we etch a, a cylindrical cavity with channels. However, here we have also deposited a metal electrode here. So this is this yellow part. And we've done this on both sides. And now I'm bonding this. and it's basically an ideal parallel plate capacitor. And what can you do with this? You can apply an AC voltage across the capacitor. This will generate an electrostatic force between the two plates. And if you apply an AC voltage, you will have an AC force, which will create pressure oscillations inside the, the cavity, which will push the liquid in and out of these channels. And if you do that, uh, at different frequencies, you can find what's called the superfluid Helmholtz resonance, which corresponds to an oscillation of the fluid in and out of the channel. So here is a classical Helmholtz resonator. You have this bottle, and the air in the neck of the bottle is oscillating back and forth, uh, creating a resonance. What we've done here is, a, is an analog of, of this at low temperature using superfluid helium instead of air. So the Color here shows the velocity of the fluid. So red means a lot of velocity. You see that in the four channels, so it's like having four necks instead of one, <clears throat> the superfluid is oscillating in, in, in these four channels. Uh, with this, we put it in a dilution refrigerator and uh, at base temperature, we obtain a Q factor of 10 to the six, which, which is quite large. Uh, but not as high as the, what would be predicted by as uh, you know limited by three phonon process. And the reason is that this is um, there, there are a few reasons. Uh, uh, one of them is the, the dissipation caused by the substrate itself. So here we have moving parts. The, the two plates here are oscillating and therefore the dissipation of the substrate itself is contributing to the losses. In addition, this was immersed inside a helium container and you, uh, because these plates are moving, they are generating uh, acoustic waves in the container. And so you have radiation losses in the container. So that was the, we think the origin of the limitation of the Q factor. So how can we go beyond that? This is what I'm gonna talk about now um, and try to reach this high predicted uh, Q factors. And one idea is to engineer the, the, the structure um, a little bit more. And instead of having just a, a cylindrical cavity, the idea is to have this fancy shape, which is a substrate that has a cylindrical, that has a lattice of cylindrical pillars here. Okay, and I have a, a defect in that lattice, which will host my mode, and I will explain why. But the advantage of using superfluidium here is that you can create that shape and then you just fill it with uh, uh, superfluid helium and helium will just fill all the voids and uh, go uh, just in between the pillars. And because you have this periodic structure, it will uh, strongly affect the propagation of acoustic modes inside the fluid. I didn't mention it, but you have another substrate on the top here, which is not shown. And uh, so the, the fluid is confined between these two substrates. And in addition, you have all these pillars in the 2D plane. And um, because you have a large acoustic impedance mismatch between superfluid helium and any other solid material, the interface between the solid and the liquid act like a perfect mirror. So you have a very high reflectivity of phonons. So, so it's a perfect mirror for acoustic phonons. And um, because of that, it forms some sort of uh, phononic crystal. Um, 
uh, actually it's called a sonic crystal because it's it's a uh, it's a fluid um, in which the propagation is uh, considered. If you had a solid material, it would be a phononic crystal. Here it's it's called a sonic crystal. It's a two D sonic crystal because that uh, third dimension here um, D is uh, is very small compared to the lateral dimensions. So we are talking about something that is of the order of 200 nanometer or so in height and tens of microns in, in width. And this is what you get uh, for your phononic uh, band structure because of this lattice. So in that uh, simulation, we took this simple square lattice with these dimensions for the pillar. So the pillar has a radius of, um, has a diameter of 80 micron and the distance between pillar is 100 micron. And you have this band structure. Uh, here is the residual vector, which is given in this uh, plot here. Uh, this is the vector associated with this lattice. The important part here is are this blue region in which you have band gaps. And so depending on how you make your crystal, you can have uh, the band gaps being uh, more or less uh, wide. So here, this band gap, that is the band gap we want to we want to look at. And so by having a defect in that lattice, what we do is actually we create an acoustic mode right in the center of that band gap. And the frequency uh, for the simulation is 1.35 meg. OK, so we have our lattice. We remove one pillar. We have a defect. And then if you simulate the acoustic field in that uh, 2D structure, this is what it looks like uh, with a maximum of the field here in the center. And you see that the field is uh, dropping down here as you go away from the center. That is because of the band gap. The band gap is telling you that acoustic propagation is forbidden in the region. And therefore, the acoustic field um, is evanescent. So it vanishes exponentially. So it's basically confining all your acoustic field inside that, uh, that defect. And this is the, the, the mode that we want to study. OK, so what are the uh, expected losses in that structure? We expect a bit of radiation losses from the fact that our crystal is not infinite. So it's not a perfect band gap. Uh, we have to give a, a certain size. And you can calculate how much loss you get depending on the number of pillars you have. And our simulations indicate that if you make the the crystal large enough, like of the order of you know, 10 by 10 unit cells, that's large enough to reduce the losses uh, significantly, such as the, you, you will have less losses than what the Trifon process is giving. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt, Zev. Yeah. Can you please wrap up within three, four minutes? Yeah, OK, thanks. So there is another source of loss um, that is coming from the fact that the substrate is actually contributing to the mode as well. So you see that purple region here, it's a strain inside the substrate. Of course, ideally you would like to avoid it. And you see that we've done, um, we, we have engineered this uh, structure such as, we don't have really an acoustic propagation. So we don't have an acoustic field propagating inside the structure. That is because of the size of the structure and so on. What we have is just a small strain inside the structure, but this deformation contributes to the mode and therefore losses in the substrate are important. And the result of our simulation indicate that as long as you are using this type of material, silicon quartz or sapphire, you are fine. The, the reduction of the Q factor coming from um, the substrate itself is minimal. And it's, it's given here as a percentage uh, with uh, this constant here. So that, that's just what these uh, simulations are, are, are telling us. So here is the, the system we have in mind. So it's a 3D microwave box, okay. Um, we have pin couplers, the standard technique to couple <clears throat> microwave field in and out. And we have our nanofluidic chip inside. We have antennas here. This is the black rectangle on this side and another antenna on the other side. And these antenna enable us to couple the 3D microwave field and route it inside this, uh, this uh, nanofluidic chip. And what we have inside the chip is the following. So this is an SEM image of one of our chip. 
we have the, you recognize here these dark disks, they are the pillars. And in the center, you have this uh, sort of square shape. It's our bottom electrode. So the electrode will be localized at the center of our point defect where we have the acoustic mode. We will have another electrode on the top. This form our capacitor. And our capacitor is part of that uh, resonator. So uh, what happens in the, in, inside the, the capacitor will be will basically uh, uh, be measured as a frequency shift of our microwave resonance. Uh, this is a simulation of the electric field in that uh, geometry for one of our uh, devices. Okay, so that's it for the for the the, the proposal, so to speak. And now I'm going to really briefly uh, talk about our preliminary result. So we started in a, in, a, in a group with a, an old fridge that we have. It's an Oxford instrument from the 80s. We refurbished it, uh, uh, special acknowledgement to Seb, who did a lot of work on, on this. So we, we've, we've, we've got our fridge, we installed some microwave lines, uh, uh, so pretty standard with uh, attenuation on one side and amplification on the other. We have one of our experiments here uh, on the mixing chamber of our fridge. And we spent some time working on the couplers, what should be the ideal uh, couplers for microwave uh, uh, to, to uh, couple the microwaves in and out of the cell. The challenge here is to have like hermetic couplers because superfluidium uh, is a very uh, uh, fancy uh, substance which can create superfluid leak very easily. So you want very hermetic, uh, uh, an hermetic system which does not really exist for microwaves. So we have to, we had to, to engineer a special uh, things here. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we've started to measure the microwave mode. Uh, we have observed different modes and we can identify the mode in which uh, we are interested in. And this uh, mode at 4.2 gigs was exactly the mode that we have. Uh, measured in the, in the simulation and, and measure experimentally. So we know it's the right mode. We have not found yet the, the coupling to the mechanical uh, mode and we are, we are working uh, hard. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip this. This is my conclusion. I'll let you read it and I will thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks very much, Xavier, for a very nice and clear talk. I think we already have a question in the chat. It's from Priya Sharma. What sets the length scale for decay of this mid cap mode as you move away from the defect? That's a very good uh, question. I'm trying to close the, anyway, I'm gonna go back. I think, let me remove the pointer really. <laughs> I cannot see my mouse. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you are talking about that uh, decay here, the the the, the land scale for the, the decay of the evanescent uh, field. Um, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So so basically, you see, you have a unit cell of the order of one hundred microns. So that's the distance between pillar, and you have the diameter of pillar. So if you make that difference uh, smaller, so if that uh, distance between these two disks here is make is made smaller, then you get a, a smaller landscape. So that's one uh, element of it. So this is uh, a completely independent of the material properties of helium. Uh, I think- Completely engineered by your structure, basically. Yes, and, and also, the, I mean, probably uh, the, the sound velocity. I mean, yeah, the structure and the sound velocity of helium would Define sound velocity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Let's take one more question from John. What is the expected capacitance from these small electrodes? Yeah, uh, that's true. It's it's small. We expect something below the picofarad. And uh, yeah, we we are planning to to uh, we don't have this the the method yet to measure it directly, and we we are planning to do that actually to to step back and, and, and measure the capacitance directly and, 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 and do similar things that we, we've done before. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's basically what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, Xavier, thanks a lot again. Thank you. So, the next speaker is Professor John Davis. He did his master's and PhD from Northwestern University, and then he moved to University of Alberta for his postdoc. And then he, in 20, 2010, he became an assistant professor there. And at present, he is an associate professor working with superconductivity and superfluidity, especially in helium-3, which work at very ultra low temperature. And his group also explores quantum properties of nanomechanical resonators and much more. So without a further ado, uh, let's start your talk, John. Thanks, Saba. Um, actually, I was promoted to full professor last year. So that was, uh, that was nice. So, no longer. So. Anyway. Um, yeah, so can you see my, my screen there? Yes. Okay. I and uh, so thank you very much. What a pleasure to be here uh, and what an uh, exciting um, group of talks, a whole whole block of talks on superfluid optimal mechanics. I think that that's really fa fantastic to me. Um, as Saba said, I, I'm John Davis. I'm from the University of Alberta, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, superfluid helium electromechanics, and it pairs really well with what Xavier was was talking about. <clears throat> I've also got a startup called Zero Point Cryogenics you can, you can check out. Um, so I want to, I want to just start since I know that most of you are optomechanics people and not, uh, quantum fluids people. I want to start and just kind of chat about, about helium for a few minutes. And, and here I point out superfluid helium four, uh, because my group also works in superfluid helium three and, and I'll just mention it briefly, but, but we probably don't have time to talk about it today. But you know, helium four as a as a, a liquid is extremely interesting, right? So as we know from thermodynamics, that when we cool a gas down, you know, the third law tells us that a gas uh, to decrease the entropy fast enough should transition into a uh, a liquid, and when we cool a liquid down further, it should transition into a solid, just to follow the third law of thermodynamics. Well, it turns out that helium, you know, you can think of it as these sort of atoms that are vibrating around as these as these harmonic oscillators. And when they and because, you know, with a with a with a um, an energy of H bar omega over two in the in the ground state. Right. So if you imagine this, this the quantum harmonic oscillators with a, with an energy of H bar omega over two and uh Omega is square root of K over M. Well, the mass of helium is so small that that frequency is very high, and that and that zero point energy is so high, and it's so high, in fact, that it prevents helium from solidifying. Right. So so helium stays a liquid all the way towards absolute zero, and so this is really at odds with the third law of thermodynamics, and tells us that. Um, that you know we have a problem with the third law, and so how can we reconcile having a liquid and and having the third law of thermodynamics? And the answer is this superfluid that Xavier talked about. Basically, because helium four is bosonic, and we think of the quantum harmonic oscillator problem, all the atoms can basically uh, pile up in the in the quantum ground state, and we can have this Bose-Einstein condensate. And this you know now that all the atoms are in 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 one state. Right. And so, you know, KB log one is zero. So, so this satisfies the third law and, and we're happy again. So this is really the origin of this very unusual uh, state, this superfluid state. So this happens around 2.17 Kelvin, which is really interesting historically because um, Kamerling Onis, who was the first person to liquefy helium in 1908, um, was a very good thermodynamicist, right? He liquefied helium and it, it, it became a liquid at 4.2 Kelvin at ambient pressure. And, you know, he knew that if he pumped on helium, he could cool it down further. And he, they did that. And, and already in 1908 and somewhere between 1908 and 1911, they, they definitely got down to about 0.8 Kelvin by pumping on, on helium, but never just uh, mentioned that or discovered that, that, this superfluid state, which, which is really interesting. It wasn't until 1938 that it was conclusively discovered. Um, and I really like to think, you know, so we all know that from like the microwave background experiments that the universe is ambient temperature is about 2.7 Kelvin, which is not so far from 2.17 Kelvin. And in fact, there are places in the universe where the universe, where the local environment's expanding so fast that it cools 
the uh, the local environment. So this is actually the Boomerang Nebula, and it's expanding so fast that the ambient temperature in the Boomerang Nebula is 1.5 Kelvin. So I like to think of this, this you know, and, and helium is the second most abundant element in, in, in the in the universe, right? Right after hydrogen. So I like to think that maybe there's a, a spot in the Boomerang Nebula with you know seas of superfluid helium or something, right? Some some sci-fi kind of uh, ideas. But you know, it's it's possible that this could exist in nature. But from an optomechanics perspective, you know, it has some really advanced, uh, attractive properties. It has an extremely large band gap, so 19 eV. So if for uh, you, you heard Warwick Bowen and, and Jack Harris, both are doing optical uh, superfluid optomechanics. And that, that really large band gap means that they have very, very low optical absorption. Helium also has an extremely low dielectric loss. So if you put the helium in a microwave cavity, for example, you know, you're gonna have a very low loss from that and has this very low acoustic loss that, that Xavier talked about, which is dominated by this three, uh, photon, three phonon process. And, you know, excitingly, helium is intrinsically quantum, right? And so there's a lot of uh, kind of possibilities that, that can come from, from that. Um, on the flip side is helium-3, and I, and I won't tell you about our helium-3 work today, just in, in the interest of time, but, you know, helium-3 is fermionic, and so you can't have that same, you still have that same um, fact that the zero-point motion is keeping it a, a liquid, but you can't have that, you know, condensation to the quantum ground state um, because they're fermions, and, and so you actually end up having to have a, a pairing mechanism between the helium-3 atoms so that they can form composite bosons just like in a, in a superconductor. And, and those, you know, Cooper pairs would condense. And now helium is, is charge neutral. And so this means that the pairing mechanism is very, very weak. And so this is why this uh, actually, it comes around from, it comes about from a, a nuclear dipole interaction between the helium three atoms. So weak that this is why the, the pairing doesn't really happen until around two milli Kelvin, a thousand times colder than, than helium four. This was discovered in 1972 by Ashraf Richardson and Lee at Cornell, and almost certainly does not exist in nature. So I think it's really fantastic and to think about, you know, these, these states that, uh, that exist only because humankind ha has made them. Now, uh, I'm sure you all know about cavity optomechanics, so I'm actually going to just skim over this really quick. You know, this idea that we form an optical cavity with one end mirror, uh, one, one mirror of an optical cavity movable, we can get this optical uh, resonance. We get a standing wave condition with an optical resonance. And if we measure that optical resonance properly, we're gonna get a time varying transmission or reflection or phase uh, signal, which we can Fourier transform and, and get into a mechanical signal. In optomechanics, the standard parameter is called this G, which is how much the, the cavity frequency shifts per unit length uh, of the motion of the mechanics. And in, in the helium optomechanics, we're gonna really think about D omega dp how much the, the frequency is going to shift for a pressure fluctuation in the, in the helium since it is a liquid. You can do the same thing with cavity optomechanics that you can with a cavity electromechanics, and that is you know, building an LC circuit where now you have the, the, the capacitor generally mechanically compliant, and so you, you form in exactly the same physics where you get an, uh, a standing wave condition, you get an, an amplitude or a phase. And, and it's usually very easy to do a, a homodyne system with electromechanics. So you're usually gonna be looking at, at the phase. So now combining these two was really done first by De Lorenzo and Schwab in 2014 and 2017. These really were the land, kind of landmark experiments. And, and so what did they do? This is kind of give us a good spot. So they, they took a, th a three-dimensional microwave cavity filled out of uh, made out of niobium with this high Q microwave resonance, and they filled it with helium. And the helium is going to have these breathing modes, so these mechanical breathing modes. And so the question is now, how do these mechanical breathing modes couple to that microwave cavity to get a, a cavity electromechanical system? So we're not, we don't have the, the, the walls of the 3D microwave cavity moving, so it's not this. It's in fact imagining a dielectric moving in and out of this capacitor that that is is what happens and, and so if you move a dielectric in a capacitor you get the same kind of frequency shift and so this is this is your electromechanical coupling to helium now one thing is that the the dielectric constant is, as Xavier pointed out is 1.056 so that's very small so this this 
uh, dielectric moving in the helium is going to cause a very small frequency shift. So basically what we're going to have is a pressure fluctuation, which is going to move into some local areas of this, of this uh, microwave resonator, so in, into some local electric field. So the, the pressure fluctuations are going to change the dielectric constant locally, which is going to change the microwave resonance. And so, so already in 2014, already in 2017, they realized with the help of Swati Singh, who's at University of Delaware, that sort of the, the one beautiful application of this, this system would be to look for gravitational waves. And so I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about this gravitational wave antenna. Um, as we all know, uh, LIGO is this laser gravitational interferometer, which uses a, exactly a cavity optomechanical system with, with the light bouncing back and forth between these arms, you know, but, but interestingly, you know, the, these arms are damped and we actually, as a gravitational wave passes through LIGO, it stretches one arm and compresses the other arm. And it's really this differential signal that is detected by the, the photo detector. And that's because these gravi you know, gravitational waves are, are quadrupolar in nature. They stretch space time in one way and compress it in the other. And LIGO actually works in an off-resonant detected uh, detection scheme. These, these mirrors are damped. And so they don't have a resonance here like you would in cavity optomechanics, but they use the off-resonant signal to get the strain sensitivity. And that, that broadband is really nice. It'll what allow them to measure these kind of transient signals that, that change with, with time. And this was the first discovery uh, in 2016. So that's not the only kind of detector you can have for gravitational waves. Early uh, competitors for the laser interferometers were these solid systems called Weber bar antenna. And these really were massive blocks of aluminum, which now have a really high Q. And you can imagine a gravitational wave coming in and exciting some mechanical mode in this, in this bar. And so this has actually been implemented. This is an, a gravitational wave detector called Auriga. And you can see this is a massive system, right? This cryostat so the, uh, is used to super cool this aluminum bar, and it sits in there. And you can just see the scale of this thing is just absolutely gigantic. And so they have this same kind of suspension system. And I'll come back to this in, in just a second. So our idea was to take this idea of making a Weber bar, right, out of superfluid helium that, that DiLorenzo and Schwab talked about, but now just make a few advances to make it more sensitive to gravitational waves. And in particular, just like uh, we have with um, LIGO, we wanted to make this sort of cross-shaped geometry, and that's so that you can have uh, really uh, this sensitivity to quadrupolar gravitational waves. So if we look just at the general equation for the, the force sensitivity of a, of a mechanical resonator, you want to go to very low temperatures because you want to decrease your, your force noise, your thermal force, force noise. You want to go to very low temperature and you want to have a very high mechanical Q. And so, so helium is really well suited to this. It's easy to cool down and it can have this very high Q that, that Xavier was talking about. If you equate that, that force sensitivity to the force uh, from uh, a gravitational wave, you, get, you can get a strain sensitivity. And you realize that to, to minimize your strain sensitivity, you also want this cross-sectional area to, to be as large as possible. That is, you want to design your system so that it looks like the gravitational wave that's coming in. And so that's why you want this quadrupolar uh, nature. And so we, we built this, this cross-shaped geometry and you can see there's a, a variety of different mechanical modes, but these are the two that we're gonna be really interested in, this one minus one. You can see the pressure goes to a maximum here and, a, and, a, and a, 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 a goes to like kind of positive here and, and negative here. And this is exactly the kind of thing that's gonna to couple to a gravitational wave that, that's coming uh, into the plane here. And so we built this, uh, this mode and actually it's kind of nice, you know, whenever you have mechanics, you wanna, you wanna see if you can figure out, you know, you have a lot of mechanical modes. How do you figure out which one it is? Well, actually nicely, we can put some, some piezos on the side of this and excite them. And we can really sort out which mode is which. And, and I'm not gonna tell you too much about that. But you can see one difficulty in these systems is because they're low frequency, sort of kilohertz and they're high Q. These are Q of about a million. 
you can see that the time constant is really long, hundreds and hundreds of seconds. So these are difficult measurements to do because of that long time constant. But you know, it's good for our sensitivity. Uh, just to show you briefly that you know we really did uh, do a good job. You know, these gravi these quadrupole, these uh, cross shaped geometry are good for detecting uh, gravitational waves. And there's two. This one minus one and the two minus two are, are both well adapted to search for gravitational waves. So our effective masses uh, are on the scale of, of grams and our areas are on the, on the scale of square centimeters. Now, the other advance we made over the Lorenzo and Schwab experiment was instead of coupling directly to the dielectric constant, we were, you know, because it was so small, what we wanted to do is really put in an amplifier. And so now what happens in the helium fluctuates, we had a pressure fluctuation. We have this thin membrane and the pressure actually pushes on that membrane. And we have a separate microwave cavity, which is uh, attached here. And this is a kind of a funny microwave cavity. Sorry, this image is upside down for, with respect to this one. You have this little stub, which is called a reentrant microwave cavity. And so this is that stub. And this is where the electric field exists. And you can see it really exists very much between the membrane and the stub. So if the membrane is displaced, we're essentially changing the capacitance of our system. And we make a big change in the microwave uh, resonance of this, of this system. So it really is an amplifier of the pressure fluctuations pushing on this membrane. So this is a superconducting membrane that's only about 100 microns thick. So it pushes that and it pushes that towards the, to the, it deforms the, the 3D microwave cavity. Turns out when we go back into the literature and look, that's actually exactly how Ariga does their detection. So they have this, this big mechanical resonator and they have another mechanical resonator here, which couples the energy into this is their kind of reentrant stub 3D microwave cavity. We didn't know this at the time, but uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, gratifying to go back and look at that we did something uh, as well engineered as theirs is. Okay, not quite as well engineered as theirs is, but that same sort of principle. One nice thing about this system is when you when you take a, and you can just directly measure your optomechanical coupling, your your d omega dp by just pressurizing the system. So here we pressurize the the helium in this system. And the microwave resonance frequency shifts massively. You can see at a half a bar, it's already shifted by almost a gigahertz. So our, our D omega uh, DP is 1.8 gigahertz per bar, which is three orders of large, uh, magnitude larger than the Derler and Joan Schwab experiment, which is what allowed us to measure the, the zero point fluctuation, sorry, the thermomechanical fluctuations of our, not the zero point fluctuations, the thermomechanical undriven fluctuations of, of these mechanical resonances. And here are the two modes I was uh, interested in before this one minus one and the two minus two. So as soon as I can do thermal mechanical measurement, this is at 20 millikelvin. I can do a displacement sensitivity, uh, a displacement calibration. And you can see the sensitivities on the scale of femtometer per root hertz, which is pretty much standard uh, for electromechanical and optomechanical systems. Once you have your calibrated displacement, you can turn that into a calibrated strain sensitivity. And you can see our strain sensitivity on resonance reaches all the way down to 10 to the minus 18 uh, per root Hertz. So the question is, okay, first, by the way, just uh, Swati has uh, shown us that there are gravitational wave sources in this sort of kilohertz regime, which we might be able to detect with this system. So if you, if you look at the strain sensitivity of our, of our system, here's those two modes. And there's some various sources that might be uh, uh, possible, some axion decay, some axion annihilation. These are primar primordial black holes. These are neutron star mergers, and these are millisecond pulsars. And interestingly, the black line on here is advanced LIGO. So this is LIGO as running right now. And you can see our strain sensitivity is about five orders of magnitude worse than LIGO, which that may sound bad, but we're actually five orders of magnitude shorter than LIGO as well. So um, I would say that, 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 you know, we're five orders of magnitude shorter with five orders of magnitude worse strain sensitivity. That, that means that's, that's a really great metric. We're, uh, we're really hitting it right on the money. Um, interesting, my postdoc Marvin, who did a lot of the work on this, uh, 
Experiment also likes to say that it was probably five orders of magnitude less expensive than, than LIGO as well. Now, <clears throat> one interesting thing here though, you know, is that I told you that I have this very narrow band detector. So LIGO was, was uh, off resonance. So it's got very broad band. Just like a Weber bar, we're gonna you know, use this high Q resonance and we're gonna have this very narrow resonance right there. Uh, so why am I showing it as a dashed line? Well, this is really the this is really the killer feature of a superfluid Weber bar, which is by tuning the pressure, I can tune the speed of sound. Right, the speed of sound in helium is is dependent on the pressure, and so I can tune the speed uh, the pressure tuning the speed of sound and changing the resonant frequency of the system. And so I really have a tunable gravitation high Q narrow band gravitational wave detector. And that's really a, a cool thing because you can imagine I have some source, I could, for example, lock to that source and, and correct for any shifts in the, in the frequency from, for example, the, the Earth's rotation or something like this, um, Doppler shifts. So I could also um, imagine doing a frequency sweep and looking for sources by doing a frequency sweep, by doing a pressure sweep. So I think this is the real advantage and why this is a, a really interesting system. Uh, for gravitational wave detection. Okay, although we're not gonna beat LIGO, there are some interesting things you could imagine doing. Uh, you know, so again, this frequency tunability is, is the key system. We have low acoustic loss and low, uh, low dielectric loss, which are a big bonus. There are clearly ways to improve this. We can get bigger, but I think that's, you know, we could imagine LIGO size superfluid detectors. I think that's not going to happen. Uh, instead, you can imagine making arrays of these detectors. And, and, and I think that's really where the interest will lie in the future is making arrays of these of systems and maybe even steering and pointing it at particular sources. I actually think that the future isn't in gravitational waves. It's in, in dark matter detector. And that's where my student Marvin is taking this, this uh, work now. Okay, so I, I know I'm supposed to stick to around 30 or 35 minutes. So I'm, you know, that was... Okay, I got a lot of other things to talk about. So I'm just going to try to skim through some of these. So Xavier told us all about now taking these kind of 3D electromechanical, superfluid electromechanical systems and moving it down to 2D. So this work was really pioneered by Xavier when he was in my group in, in 2015 and then followed up by Fabian Suri, uh, who was the next postdoc after, after Xavier. So these, these systems where we really, you know, now move from 3D to 2D by going to the nanofab and making these devices either out of, out of glass or out of quartz, putting the electrodes inside of them. And now we have a system where the helium is gonna be confined inside of this system, confined between two electrodes, right? It, you know, this dielectric in the capacitor kind of uh, approach. Again, uh, Xavier told us, but just to remind you what we're going to do is we're going to have these electrodes in the system. When you put a small voltage across that, actually, because the this gap is so small, sort of hundreds of nanometer scale, we're going to get a really large electrostatic force, which is going to push these plates together. And if there's helium on the inside and outside of this device, we're going to actually squeeze some helium out of the channel. So as the helium goes squeezing out of the channel, we uh, actually have now this kind of plug, which if we did this AC, we could kind of move back and forth. And so now what we really have is a mass spring system where the helium is the in, in the channel is our mass and the spring constant of the plate and the helium is our, is our, uh, is our, is our restoring force. And that's exactly like this, you know, you blow across the top of a beer bottle and you get that whistle, right? That woo. Or you roll down one window of your car and you get that thumping. That's also a Helmholtz resonator where, you know, you have a mass spring system where the mass is the fluid in the channel and the, and the spring constant is, is from the compressibility of the, of the beer. So this is a really excellent system because the, in fact, if you get to this sort of hundreds of nanometer scale, the normal fluid is viscously clamped. And so now you only have the superfluid moving back and forth in the channel. And so now you get a system, a mass, uh, a mass on a spring system that's really a, a direct detection of the superfluid fraction or the superfluid density. And so here you can see this, uh, a, you know, a picture of the, of the simulation of the helium moving back and forth in the channel. 
and and that the frequency of that mode is is just proportional to the superfluid density. There's a lot of advantages to a system like that. I'm going I'm going to skip through that. And just, you know, uh, right now we're going to skip kind of the cavity and just think of it as, as an electromechanical system where we're going to measure this mass on a spring system. And this was early work by Xavier. And you can see that, you know, you, you really get a frequency which is proportional uh, to the superfluid density. And if you, if you actually plot it nicely, you can see that it just all collapses and it, it really is a good measurement of the superfluid density. These early days, our cues were really limited by um, to you know a few hundred, which is which is crazy, because you think, oh, this is a, this viscousless flow in this medium. It should have a really high Q. Turns out that it actually that because the plates are moving, like Xavier said, the the you get dissipation from the substrate, and so this we were using glass at the time. Next postdoc Fabian actually um, moved it to quartz and you can see that when you when you move to quartz you immediately have less coupling to two level systems than you did in glass and you can raise the q up up really nicely so in 2017 we showed you know a q of almost a million uh at 13 millikelvin i think now we routine, routinely get above a, a you know kind of one or two million uh, in these devices which is now enough that we're no longer limited uh, and we can start to actually measure the properties of the superfluid, right? And that's what we're really going for, to use these as a probe of a superfluid. And, okay, so it looks like I'm amazingly out of time. So I have so, so much more to tell you about. But let me just show you briefly. Um, you can see that if you take these systems and you start to drive them, this is a normalized response. So the more you drive it, and kind of normalized, you can see that you wash out, you get this, this dissipation. So where is dissipation coming from in a system like this? Well, it's actually coming from generating vorticity, actually quantum turbulence, right? You're generating these, these quantum defects by flowing past this weird little kink in our system. This injects vorticity into our system and if you do a careful job, kind of just locking onto this resonance and sweeping up, first you're in a laminar regime where you, you, you don't generate any vorticity, and then you actually generate a whole bunch of vorticity, and eventually you transition into a new state. And it's really interesting. So then you can come back down along these channels, but there's two possible paths that you can come down along. And that's very unusual, having two paths that you come down along. And, and, and even more weird is that when you come down along this channel, as you decrease the drive, you can actually transition into a state that has lower velocity, which means there's more vorticity. And so we've actually done some simulations. We, when we realize what that is, there's actually uh, two possible configurations that this is actually ordered vorticity. So instead of just having this jumbled turbulence that you might expect, you know, you stir up a system and you generate a whole bunch of turbulence. In fact, what's happening here is now the turbulence, the, the vorticity is ordering. It's becoming a macroscopically ordered system, which is very unusual. The harder you drive it, the more ordered it becomes, which is really unusual, sort of like uh, a laser that, that is when it's driven, you know, that you get this population inversion and it's like a negative temperature. And that's what's happened here, that as you drive this system, it becomes more ordered. And so what we have is actually a transition between these two states. So you can have one of two possible states, but as you go down here, you actually only, only get one of them. And this is, is uh, an unusual observation in, in this quantum turbulence system, but is actually very well known in classical turbulence. So in three-dimensional turbulence, if you stir up a system, you expect to actually uh, just have all the energy cascade down to low energies, uh, low length scales and, and dissipate, instead of having it kind of conglomerate into this macroscopic order, except in two dimensions in classical turbulence, you know that this happens. And, and in fact, this is what happens on Jupiter, right? So if you look at Jupiter, the atmosphere is very thin compared to how large it is. And you actually get this macroscopic ordering. And these, all these kind of cyclones are very, very stable. And you, and you can, they can last for, you know, as long as we know about. 
these systems can, can last. And, and this is really uh, an exact uh, analogy to, to these systems where the more it's driven in a two-dimensional system, the more ordered the vorticity can be. And actually, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but this is the pole of Saturn where the vorticity has actually um, aligned to make this really interesting hexagon. Uh, and this is, these are, it's actually because there's vortices uh, uh, aligned along this. I think there's, you know, six on the corners and one there. And so you really get this ordered vorticity in, in two-dimensional systems. So I think uh, that's really, really uh, interesting. Saba, how much time do I have left? Should I, and should I wrap it up? Yeah, two, three minutes. Okay, two, three minutes. Okay, so I'm not gonna have time to, um, I'm not gonna tell you about our, our, our feedback control. I'm gonna just tell you really quickly about some topological phase transitions, okay? So, you know, I've, you know we're talking about these, these systems that are nearly two dimensional. You know, they're, they're kind of hundreds of nanometers by you know millimeters and the question is can we really see anything that's truly 2d right and you probably have heard of the merman wagner theorem which said that you can't have phase transitions in 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 below three dimensions you can't have to phase transitions specifically in two dimensions well this was disproven by Kosterlis and thallus who, who showed that in what's called the xy model so this is a, a two-dimensional model where you can imagine these spins can point either along x or along y that you actually can have a phase transition this is called the Kosterlis thallus phase transition if you have vortex anti-vortex pairs and these vortex anti-vortex pairs can can really come at, you know out of out of nothing and if you have at very low temperatures, these vortex anti vortex pairs that are bound. Now that you can have very low dissipation, but as you go up in temperature, these vortex anti vortex pairs can unbind, move around, and cause a dissipation. And that dissipation should be observable in the superfluid density. And interestingly, there's this prediction that that the 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 jump in the superfluid density at that at that costless stylus phase transition approaches a universal constant so it really only depends on the transition temperature and the superfluid density so these were uh you know this won the nobel prize just a few years ago this this idea by costless and thalus and uh was experimentally verified by bishop and rappi in 1978 and you can see this beautiful prediction so so here's the superfluid density which you would expect to be going continuously in this second order phase transition, but instead it jumps discreetly. And so, you know, you can, these were, these kinds of experiments are really beautiful, but we're done in thin films of helium. And so now we have a, a brand new Helmholtz geometry, which f allows us for the first time to measure these kind of costular stylus phase transition in a confined system. Now with this, uh, so I, I don't have time to tell you, but basically we have two, two of these devices with the helium moving just in back and forth in this, this little confined uh, uh, channel. Now where the confinement is only on the scale of, of 25 or 50 nanometers. This gives us two modes, one where it's is kind of like before and one where the helium is just moving in the channel. And this is the mode where the helium is just moving in the channel. And we can do a lot of different detection, but you can see that at some point that that mode through the channel just disappears. And that's this costular stylus phase transition. You can see the bulk physics is coming along like this. This is the superfluid density and this is the reduced temperature. So this is closer and closer to TC. And you can get this just sudden extinction of the superfluid from the, exactly this costular stylus jump. And so we've seen the, this costular stylus physics in, the, in this kind of unusual length scale. So it's a little bit bigger than, uh, it's bigger than these thin films, but smaller than our, our previous geometry. So we can now see real uh, interesting physics in, in this system. And you know, because it's fully confined, we could do something for the first time, which was measure the pressure dependence. Because the, pre because the, the, the super TC depends on the pressure, we can tune the pressure, which should tune the, the superfluid, uh, the point of the, the jump of that costless stylus phase transition. Here's the prediction for this. Here's our experiment, and they don't align. So this is something very interesting. We observe as a, a note in, in this recent preprint that's up on the up on the archive. Okay, so I'm totally out of time. Um, 
just some some takeaways. So I think this microwave detection of acoustic modes uh, in helium is really promising for sensing of gravitational waves, but more so actually dark matter or you know some other kind of sensors. Um, and taking this to 2D really allows us to study some really interesting physics in the in the superfluid helium, including this quantum turbulence, and really excitingly now some some of this costerless Thales topological physics. Um, so we're really excited about that stuff and, and go have a look at that preprint and, and, and take a look. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank my funding agencies. Thank you, Saba, for organizing. Sorry, I'm a little overly. And really the credit goes to my group who does all this work. And, and I really should have mentioned them earlier. Uh, Marvin and, and Vyshek did all the gravitational wave work. Uh, Emil does, did all the turbulence. Uh, Cameron, she did the, the costular stylus work and Alex, it does some superfluid helium three uh, Helmholtz resonator physics, which I, I didn't have time to talk about. So thank you very much, uh, Saba, for having me. And sorry, I had so much stuff to talk oh, about. Very, it was really interesting talk. I'm, I could talk for another yeah, half an hour yeah. if everyone wants to stay on. I got a whole nother slide. I'm just kidding. All right. Yeah, it's a lot of work. I can imagine. So we have two questions from the audience. The one is, what did you use to simulate, simulate that? Yeah, so... so it, that's a great question. So if we looked at just the, the mechanical modes is what you're, so we, you can couple, you can simulate the mechanical modes and you can simulate the, the electromagnetic modes with ComSol multi-physics. So that's what we do to study the, um, to study the, the, the vortices though, that's a homemade simulation by uh, Emil Varga, who's really an expert in, in, um, in that. So um, yeah, it's actually really interesting, you know, that console is what's universally used to study mechanics, but console doesn't actually appropriately take into account the physics of the helium. So I propose that some, a, a project for someone is to make a superfluid module to add on to console so that you can really study, you know, and take into account the real superfluid physics in, in a console multi-physics, uh, so, so if someone wants to do that, let me know. I'll, I'll actually pay for it. You can, that would be really interesting. Okay, thanks. So there is one more question from Xavier. How does pressure affect the KT transition temperature? Yeah, thanks Xavier. So it's interesting. So you see that the costular stylus is a, a universal jump and it really only depends on TC, two things, TC and the superfluid density. So these are correlated. So if TC changes, then the superfluid uh, density should change. And that, that's really where it comes into play. So by changing the pressure, we change TC and hence should change the, the size of the costal stylus jump. And no one has ever looked at that before, right? So that has never been seen before because the costal stylus has never been explored in a system where you can pressurize it. It's only ever been done in thin films, right? And so now for the first time we have a fully confined system, we can pressurize and now see the pressure dependence of the costula salis. And so our initial uh, observations seem to be in disagreement with this universal jump, but you know, the kind of the resolution is of the experiment isn't great. It's actually sort of just noted as a footnote on this, this paper, that paper is actually about something else. It's about, uh, how you can explain these so-called finite size effects with 2D rotons. And you don't need finite size effects when you have these 2D rotons. So um, just some real, you know, basically my point is that this is a rich playground, superfluid optomechanics. You start to, con, you know, get an extreme sensitivity, a sort of unusual measurement and the sky's the limit. There's tons of physics left. And that was just helium four in helium three. There's a huge amount of other physics that you can start doing. Right. Very interesting, John. So, so you don't expect any bowing in the KT, KT transition when you pressurize as well, right? Yeah. It's right. Immersed. Remember that our devices are, yeah. are hydrostatic, right? So yeah. when we pressurize our device, it's equivalently pushing on the outside of our chip and then the inside of our chip, yeah. right? So there's no bowing in, in our devices when we pressurize. Yeah. Yeah. And that code for vortices, is it public somewhere? Great question. Probably. Uh, Maybe not. Eve, if you if you want, send me an uh, uh, email, and I will put you in touch. Or you can just email Emil. 
The uh, meal actually is, is this question was from Eve. Yeah. So Eve, so you but can I email me to have, if I can. What's that? Yeah, I would also like to have a look if I can. Yeah. So you can you can email me and I can put you in touch with Emil who wrote the code, or you can just write Emil. It's ev at ualberta.ca. And Emil is actually going off this fall to start his own group at uh, um, in the Czech Republic. So that's very exciting. So he'll be joining you in the in the in the European Union there. Yeah, she's a, I mean, thanks. I'll email you soon. Sorry, I got excited. There's lots of fun stuff to talk about in Superfluid Optimal Mechanics. What a great idea for a session, Saba. Thank you. I'm really interested in, especially in 2D superfluids, it's quite exciting and it's not been explored yet. So. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And of course, I'm always looking for new postdocs. So if you're, if you're, if you're, uh, want to head on over, uh, this is a good time to do it. We're no longer in, no one's in lockdown anymore. So you can travel, come join my group. Yeah. So do we have any more questions? I think, no, that's all. So thanks again for a very exciting talk and I learned a lot. Thanks, Xavier, for, for, for headlining. It was great uh, introduction, great. Uh, it's great to see, you know, this kind of work that you started has its legs of its own and it's really, it's really beautiful. I wish Thank you the you best better. of luck. Hope that, hope to get, see that mechanic soon. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, John. Thanks for your talk. Thanks. Bye all. Bye. Bye.